Hello, my name's Anton Brown, and I'd like to welcome you to this uh, series of videos called The Magic of the Microphone. I'm hoping to look at vocal microphones and how they work to some extent, but more importantly, further on with other videos, reviewing some of the more popular microphones and some of the best in the world to uh, help with your choice of the microphone for your own voice. But I think it's worth starting with asking the question, what is a microphone and how does it do what it does? A microphone is a transducer. It converts the physical vibrational energy of your voice into an electric signal, which is hopefully an exact representation. This is not so easy to do and there are engineering compromises as you can imagine. So basically what it does, a dynamic microphone, Shure SM58 is the classic, is it has a diaphragm. I'm going to zoom in here, so hopefully you'll be able to see a bit clearer, a bit more clearly. Diaphragm represented by the white disc, the black edge is secured in a housing. Sound waves hit that diaphragm and cause it to vibrate. On the back of the diaphragm is a coil of wire, cylindrical, and inside that coil of wire is a magnet. The vibrations cause the coil of wire to move relative to the fixed magnet, and that generates an electric signal. Don't ask me how. There's plenty of websites where you can look at the, uh, the physics of that. That's what's going on when you sing into a microphone you're causing that to happen. I have a broken microphone here, which came as a job lot of a few microphones. There's one in particular I was after, and these were included. And you can see the diaphragm there is under that disc. There's your coil of wire. You might be able to see the magnet in there. And these fine wires take the signal that's generated to the pins on the bottom there. It's a very tiny signal and needs amplifying a lot. The amplifier amplifies that electric signal and then sends it to the speakers, which are kind of the reverse of the microphone. And they, the transducers as well, they turn it back into physical sound and then you get to hear uh, uh, whatever the microphone has picked up. I thought it might be a good idea then to look at what the perfect microphone would be and see where the difficulties are in engineering that, though I'm no engineer, and where these fall short of that, perhaps. The first thing on my list says it would transcribe every aspect and detail of your voice perfectly. So the tiniest parts, to the louder parts, to the low parts, all of that would be represented perfectly. That's asking a lot. And we don't have the uh, technology, maybe never will. Well, don't never say never. So microphone manufacturers have to compromise. For instance, if you want a really tough microphone that can withstand being dropped and heavy use, then this material might need to be quite thick, quite tough. However, the thicker it is and the heavier it is, the less likely it is to respond to the very fine parts of your voice. That's just one compromise that a manufacturer might have to look at. The second thing on my list is that a perfect microphone would not add anything. So you don't want ringing noises from the grill, uh, any other noises. You don't want um, kind of uh, a resonant frequency in the diaphragm that adds a kind of to everything. So it wouldn't add, add anything. A perfect microphone would not cause feedback so feedback is the sound from the speakers going back into the mic, being amplified again, coming out of the speakers, going back into the mic, and quickly you end up with a ringing sound. 
can often it's high pitched, but it can be low, it can be all over the place, or it can be several. Uh, that's difficult to see how you could engineer that, that it would only pick up the voice, but there are ways of narrowing what it picks up, which we'll discuss in the second video. A perfect microphone would not pick up handling noise. This diaphragm has an elastic suspension around the edge there, so when it sits in there, it's isolated just a little from any vibration here. If I held this to one side, then you can imagine that any vibration on the hand and the body would not be transferred to this. Of course, you can't have, you want the whole thing to be in one. So there's various forms of reducing that. It's difficult to eliminate it within something this size. You can see uh, this has an elastic suspension. And the idea of that is that it, any noise traveling up the mic stand doesn't affect the microphone. That's the idea of it. Another issue is that it would withstand stage use or abuse. If you had a wonderful microphone, delicate, everything, but the minute you dropped it or knocked it, it broke it. It'd probably be expensive anyway to get a microphone like that. And you had to keep replacing it. It's not, it's not really much good to keep interrupting the show. It cost you an arm and a leg. So they need to be robust. Again, is a compromise, as you know. I've, the next one I've got is it says a, a perfect microphone would respond to the tiniest whisper and to the loudest yell. So again, compromise perhaps. You've got this diaphragm. It needs to be light enough, fine enough to pick up even that whispering if you wanted to. Whispering clearly so it delineates in all the in between there, the breath noises. At the same time, you've got other people who are going to shout into it and cause that diaphragm to move like this. So you don't want the diaphragm rupturing or tearing. You don't want it kind of getting to the end of its travel where it's going to distort and vibrate randomly. Another consideration. The perfect mi microphone would replicate the human ear. We hear from, it's said, 20 hertz, 20 cycles a second, to 20,000, 20 kilohertz. Some people say we can perceive beyond that, that, that uh, 20 kilohertz isn't enough. There's no point manufacturing a microphone that goes way beyond human hearing because uh, what's the point in that? It's tough enough to get it to meet human hearing. A lot of them don't go to 20 kilohertz. I think the shortest of 58 goes to 15 or 16 kilohertz. There are some that go from 30 to 20. One I've got goes from 30 kilohertz to 40,000 kilohertz. No need to engineer beyond, it's difficult enough as it is without try, trying to engineer beyond human hearing. There's something else. You look at these graphs and frequency response graphs to get some idea. You've got, you've got, to, you've got to use the thing. You, not only have you got to try them in a shop, Really, you've got to use them for a while, which is what I've been doing. And I've used them on other people as well. And even then, it's taken me a while to appreciate their idiosyncrasies and what they have to offer. So quite difficult for you, I, I imagine, if you're, you know, I don't think so many people have spent as much time and so on as I have. Um, so there's something that I wasn't aware of, and that's the speed of a microphone. I was aware of speed in loudspeakers. And what it is basically is how quickly, if I set up a tone like that, how quickly does it get up to speed? And when it when I stop, how quickly does it stop? You probably notice my hand overshot just a little. Bound to because you've got a weight doing this. I know it's a very light weight, but in its own universe, it's, it's a weight. Uh, and it needs to stop and start and change from one note to the other, go very fast. Whoops. Go very, go very fast, like a fan. Yeah. And um, that, you can imagine if it doesn't change instantaneously, it can't change instantaneously, but the quicker it changes, the cleaner the sound is to us. So a little bit of smearing, which actually you might, you might like. It depends on your, all these things, it depends on your voice. So that's why you've got to try them if you possibly can. 
In other videos, I'm going to be doing reviews and I hope to describe what I hear. One shouldn't do that in, in one sense. It should let you do the hearing, but, I, but with speakers and the internet and compression, all the rest of it. And also I find it just very difficult. I've listened a lot and it's, it's difficult. I think it probably helps if someone in, who's got some experience points you in the direction of what you could be listening for. Of course, it's always going to be my voice, not yours. But hopefully then when you go to audition mics, you'll have, your ears will be trained to some extent of the kind of things to listen for. I think that's, for, that's it for this first video. Hopefully you've got some idea how the thing works, why different microphones sound different. It's not just for the sake of it. It's because you can't make a perfect one, so you've got to make your own balance. And then if you can't make a perfect one, you've got to have some compromises. Different manufacturers try and make those compromises sound nice and pleasing. Why not? The only thing is we've all got different voices, so one that sounds pleasing on one voice might not be on another. I think that's about it for now, and uh, I look forward to seeing you on the next video. Magic of the